The automobile, one of the greatest inventions in the history of mankind and at the center of our modern free individualist culture. The automobile allowed human beings to traverse great distances in no time at all. It could move independent of railway lines and waterways and it did not have the power to kick you so hard in the head you would die. However, human beings are flawed creatures and were not designed to control a ton of screaming metal hurtling along at 120 kilometers per hour. So road safety had to be created and with road safety, came the road safety film. Back in the day, road safety films were quaint little pieces where mild-mannered narrators warned drivers of behaviours they should watch out for lest they accidentally massacre everyone around them. Again, a driver should visualise the situation. Here are cars lined up near to the curb for a left-hand turn. In fog, dip headlights, not just side lamps, should be used. Mr Worthington's wondering if it was a good idea to come up by road. Who do you think you are, Sterling Moss? Yes! But in the 2000s, road safety films were cool. They were bloody and violent, and they starred idiot drivers getting into totally preventable accidents and showed us the gruesome and grisly reality of a car accident from the safety of our living rooms. But the modern road safety film is very different. It is sad, and it is quiet, and it is mainly just survivors of real car accidents describing the untold damage done to theirs and their loved ones' lives. I wanted to figure out what brought about the change over the last 20 years, and I googled it, and there wasn't any article that just summed it up, so I did a bit of digging. I wrote 3,500 words on it, and I, I, I read studies, and I read a doctorate. I, d I did not think this was going to take up as, as much of my time as it did. So what I would like to do is I would like to look at three road safety films from the early to mid 2000s produced in Ireland. And I would like to talk about the techniques that they use to try and achieve the objective of promoting safer driving and then hopefully go on to talk about what might have brought about some of these changes. No reason, no college project, just Boredom. Part 1. Body to Body. So in the early 2000s, Ireland was actually suffering from a very high rate of road fatalities compared to other European countries. Some of the factors that were thought to be responsible for this was Ireland's relaxed drink driving culture, dangerous young drivers, and the lack of police enforcement of traffic laws. In response to this, the Road Safety Authority, or RSA, and the Department of the Environment, or DOE, produced and distributed a series of road safety campaigns which featured heavily publicized road safety adverts. All of these road safety ads follow the same basic formula. An inconsiderate driver and or passengers would get into a car. They would then drive recklessly, unaware of the danger they were putting themselves and others in. They would then lose control of the car after a sudden change in road conditions, and the car would become a weapon of mass destruction. And these road safety adverts would often show this through the use of gratuitous, violent, special effects driven spectacles, where incredible close-up slow motion shots of people's bodies being turned into mush were broadcast on television for everyone to see including me i was like five so in this film which is online as seatbelt ad but uh, i couldn't find the official campaign for it anywhere young lovers meet up on a park bench for some completely over the top pda when their friends arrive and ask them if they'd like to go for a spin a voiceover then tells us this is Michael. Today he's going to hit his girlfriend so hard she ends up with permanent brain damage. While a Samantha Mumba song plays in the background. So they get into the car and Michael neglects to put on his seatbelt. The car is then involved in a crash. Michael is then hurtled around the car and his body is turned into a projectile weapon. The film ends with Michael and two of his companions dead with his girlfriend surviving who now has to live her life with permanent brain damage. The film is super grisly, really gory. There's a lot of focus on impact shots as people are hurtled around the car. We hear necks snap and we hear heads smash through glass. 
and there's a sickening dull thud as Michael hits his girlfriend so hard she gets permanent brain damage. And as if all that wasn't bad enough, the film ends with the paramedics arriving, taking away these poor people's bodies, and then this guy turns to the camera and says, They say the guy without the seatbelt did the damage. In case you haven't gotten the point that this is Michael's fault. I remember seeing this on TV a lot when I was young. I don't know if that is just because it would stick in my memory so much or if it was actually on TV as much as I think it was. In fact, a lot of people remember this film because it's so violent, but they remember it. Maybe it's because I'm watching this again as an adult, or maybe it's because I have watched it several times to make this video, but it kind of starts to seem a bit funny. The kissing teens on the park bench who hop in the car, it feels like something out of I Know What You Did Last Summer. In fact, I don't think this film would lose any quality if you added a final shot revealing Jason Voorhees was driving the second car that hits them. So obviously this film has got a very specific objective. It wants you to fear for your life. It wants you to look at this scene and go, look, that's you, wear your seatbelt, which is very good advice and you should wear your seatbelt. And while it is good advice, it feels a bit mean-spirited. And yes, by not putting on his seatbelt, Michael did put himself and the other people in the car in danger, but it's not like he chose to give someone brain damage. Michael is also a victim in this scenario. It all starts to feel a little like public shaming. Now you might say there's no problem shaming this guy because he made a reckless decision and put people in danger, and that's fair. You also might say there's no problem shaming this guy because he's a fictional character and he does not exist, and that is also fair. But as we are going to look at later, do we really think that these techniques and this kind of presentation is going to encourage safer driving? And we have only scratched the surface of public shaming in these road safety films. So next I want to look at this DOE road safety advert that's just entitled Shame. <laughs> it's just called Shame. It's just called Shame. A man's driving to his local soccer pitch and a kid is playing soccer in his back garden somewhere. The guy goes on to play a game of five side, he wins, it's a great time. The kid is playing soccer in his back garden, everything's great. The guy then goes down to the pub for a couple of pints with the boys. The guy is driving home, he's singing along to the radio, what could go wrong? He hits a curb, his car spirals and he completely destroys the kid. At which point then he climbs out of the car all battered and bloodied when the father runs out of the house and holds his dead son in his arms weeping. At this point, the narrator then tells us to Never ever drink and drive. Before asking Could you live with the shame? <laughs> DOE supported by AXA Insurance. So this one doesn't have the exact same kind of energy as Michael. It doesn't have like a Samantha Mumba pop song soundtrack, but there is still a theatrical performative kind of melancholy to the soundtrack. Again, this film is simply saying, look, that's you. You thought you were cool playing soccer and drinking and driving, and you've killed a child. Don't do that. And again, fantastic advice. Don't drink and drive. Don't kill children. So this is another one of these road safety ads that I remember super vividly from when I was younger. Again, in my mind, it was on TV like every 40 seconds. And again, looking back as an adult, it is starting to seem a bit excessive. One of the main things about this is, is the use of soccer to link the driver and the child. It's like the film is going, look, this kid would have gone on to play his own soccer matches with his own friends and possibly have a drink after and kill his own kid. It's like they're saying this kid was going to go on to play his own soccer matches and have his own life. And isn't it terrible that it was cut short by this driver? And I'm kind of looking at it saying, it was already terrible. It was tragic enough. You don't have to oversell the vehicular manslaughter of a child. That is a very sad thing. And then there's the bit where the father comes out and he's holding his son and he's just crying and the driver has to look on. The looking at them is, is really driving it over the top and that like it's like an extra dose 
of shame on top of the normal shame a person should feel after killing a child. In fact, that final question, could you live with the shame, reveals the intention of all of these road safety ads. They are about frightening and shaming you into driving safely. They are about scaring you and shocking you and making you afraid of all of the horrible things that can happen if you don't shape up your act on the road. The final road safety film I want to talk about is Mess. It's an anti-speeding ad and I think it is the culmination of everything we've been talking about so far with regards to gross out violence and shame. So again, we're using a soundtrack, but like a performatively sad soundtrack. So we're with two young lovers again. This girl is sitting on this wall and her boyfriend is in front of her. This driver is just flying down the road. This dog jumps into the road. He swerves to avoid it and sends the car flying. The car then collides with the wall, crushing the boyfriend up against the girlfriend. There's then this shot, which has stuck with me for years of this bit of bile, like shooting out of his mouth as she is now just stuck with him pinned to her. There's a shot of the driver hurtling through the air in close up as it happens, like screaming. Then we see the other bits of the shot. People are looking on helpless. This woman is in the car screaming for her life. This mother picks up her kid and gets her away from all this carnage. And the girl is just stuck with her boyfriend lifelessly pinned to her. There is death and destruction everywhere and we're like 10 seconds in. But then we move on and we're in court now and the driver is in the court and the judge is sentencing him and very aptly sums up the point of the film where he says It is quite clear that you are driving too fast to cope with the unexpected. And this girl is in the witness box and she's watching him like staring at him. And then we go on again. And we're with the girl at the boyfriend's funeral and they go wide and the final shot we now see that this girl was paralyzed in this accident and is now wheelchair bound. And the tagline is, the faster the speed, the bigger the mess. I think this is maybe the single most over the top road safety film I have ever seen. It has everything. You have the rising music in the soundtrack. The screams of horror, the screeching metal all in the sound. Has this narrative of a beginning and a middle and an end, an overarching story that we follow with a main character. But I think this is the one that really suffers with trying to show too much. Even watching this as an adult, like I can tell this is a lot, it is excessive and it kind of makes my brain want to run and hide. Yeah, Kean from the editing room here with longer hair and worse skin. Uh, that is totally true because um, even going through this to edit it, uh, having seen it like hundreds of times now and being a grown adult, still very hard to look at. And there are loads of road safety films like this from Ireland and all over the world. And they literally use horror filmmaking techniques to get their point across. There's the audio mix with jump scares, the screaming, the blood, the quick cuts. These road safety ads are basically just short horror films, but the monster is dangerous driving. Their focus on special effects and stunts are meant to try and replicate the grisly reality of a car accident in a way that we've never seen it before. Everything from the gross stomach bile, to the close-up of someone hurtling through the air, to the impact shots. It's meant to frighten you, and it does, but it's not real. It's all hid behind the artifice of the medium they're made in. 
It reminds me of when I was 16 and our school bussed a load of us out to this like road safety conference in a hotel along with like a bunch of other people from a bunch of other schools. This guy came up and he was talking about how he was so excited to have just got his license. Uh, you know, he just turned 17, he just got his license, even though he was clearly 28. And then he was like, I'm gonna go meet my girlfriend. And he went off stage. And then the projector came on and they were showing us a film of like this guy who we had just seen getting into a car crash uh, set to Coldplay's Fix You. And we were meant to be like, oh, that sucks for him, that's terrible. And the next day, everyone had downloaded Fix You and put it on their phones. Nobody was thinking about the intricacies of road safety. So these films were designed to use violence and spectacle to educate people. But everyone I have spoken to about them just remembers the over-the-top violence. In fact, they're really just amused by it. It's like this weird collective shock we all have. So were these road safety films effective? And if they were so effective, why did they change? I'm gonna tell you, because I made a video about it. Part two, fear and budgeting in road safety advertising. So we should address that on a surface level, these films do appear to have been effective because the rate of road fatalities did go down year by year while these films played on television. You also have to factor in that this is because the RSA put huge amounts of time, energy and resources into things like decreasing the alcohol limit for drivers, introducing penalty points for poor driving, expanding the Garda traffic core, and introducing a speed camera network. In fact, research by the American Journal for Public Health in 1987 found that road safety campaigns like these can only be seen as effective when they are supported by policymakers and visual policing of these policies. But the effectiveness of these campaigns might be harder to judge when you factor in research that has been done on these type of violent road safety adverts. In a study conducted by Jennifer Algie and John Rossiter in the Taylor and Francis Journal for Intervention and Prevention in the Community, where they did research on these type of violent road safety ads in Australia, ranging from the violent blood and horror shows we have been watching to the boring yet informative talking head interview style. They measured the rate of stress a subject felt as they watched them, and what they found was that the most effective type of road safety advert used what they call a fear relief system. So a lot of road safety films attempt to use a fear only stimuli, which is basically subjecting people to visuals and sounds that will just increase their rates of fear and stress as they watch. A fear relief system tries to agitate the viewer with fear and stress, but then bring that down by adding something like a joke ending to a road safety ad or useful information that could be used to prevent an accident and bring that fear and stress to a decline. One of the examples they include is a road safety film in which they show somebody a simulated car crash and then rewind the video and do it again except this time the driver makes the right choice and they do not get into a car crash. That is seen to be more effective than just a violent blood horror show. What they deduced by the end of the study was that subjecting somebody to fear-only stimuli actually kicks your brain into a self-preservation mode. Now you might think that a self-preservation mode would be a good thing in a campaign where you are trying to get people to literally preserve themselves on the road. In fact, fear-only stimuli can be so distressing it will cause the viewer to just fully block out any emotions they are made to feel by the road safety ad, rendering the message useless. You remember earlier when I talked about how I find those road safety ads kind of funny now? I'm starting to think that maybe part of that is just my brain trying to cope with the fact that I've subjected myself to that imagery numerous times. In order for a road safety ad to be effective, you have to provide the viewer with a relief. You can't just tell somebody what not to do you have to guide them towards the right thing to do. In 2014, the DOE released another road safety ad, which was more of a throwback to their earlier styles. So basically, a group of children get ready to have class outside, set to an acoustic, slowed down version of Sweet Child of Mine. She's got a smile that it seems to me Reminds me of childhood memories Where everything was as fresh as the bright blue sky. They then proceed to have this class of children just flattened by a crashing car. Oh, sweet child of mine. 
And then they basically inform us that in the last couple of years, a classroom worth of children have been killed on Northern Ireland's roads. Since 2000, speeding has killed a classroom of our children. Shame on you. It's just called shame. The film was met with a lot of backlash and it actually got to the stage where it could only be put on TV post watershed. As well as the fact that this was brought out in 2014, which is a time where there's a lot more consideration put into what is on TV than the early 2000s. I think it is also the perfect example of a fear only stimuli. It offers absolutely no relief to the viewer. So you just block it out. You just watched an entire classroom of children die and there was nothing you could have done about it. So when I was researching this, I found another study in Australia by Robert Donovan, Jeffrey Jalla, and Nadine Henley. What they were doing was they were comparing another series of Australian road safety ads. Again, we're going from plain and the boring to the carnivals of carnage. This time what they did was they factored in the budget of these road safety films as well as their effectiveness on the viewer. So what they found was that if you take a $300,000 90 second violent bloody road safety ad, it is not guaranteed to be any more effective than a $30,000 30 second plain and boring talking head. There is no causal link between high budget special effects horror shows and effectiveness on the audience. And considering that this is not just for somebody's demo reel, it is about changing driver's behaviors, the effectiveness is more important than the quality of the special effects. As well as the money spent on special effects, these talking head road safety ads usually end up being shorter, which means you spend less time on the air time that you're using to play them. And factoring in this research into the cost of these ads versus the effectiveness of them, you can really factor that into the RSA who get a lot of their funding from the government for anything made after 2007 2008 when the financial crash hit. In fact the Northern Irish ad agency that made a lot of these very famous ads has since closed down. The Department of the Environment has gone on record to talk about how their budgets for these kind of road safety campaigns has decreased over the years. Not that it's not a priority but just that that money could maybe be better spent in other places. So factoring all of that in basically by creating this big budget hor horrific spectacle you might make people people stop listening, waste money and divert resources from actually policing the roads and making them safer. Also, this may come as a shock to absolutely no one, but what they find in this study is that the most effective type of road safety advertising is the type where you convince the viewer that they personally will be caught and punished. You can spend all of the money you want convincing people that they'll get in a horrible accident and they'll do damage to the people around them, but if you really convince somebody that they will get penalty points, they are more likely to drive safe. I think you can see this in the RSA's new approach to their drug driving campaign where they try and get people who are driving while they're stoned. Uh, before it used to be that a group of friends went out and they smoked a load of weed and then they got in the car and they drove through a red light and they got involved in a car accident. But now it is that a guy gets pulled over being tested for drugs and his horrific talking uvula rats him out. Liar. You know you smoked a joint before you left the house. You're a real liar. The guardie can test you for drugs. You can lie, but your mouth can't. That is horrific. Part three. Empathetic Fallacy In her doctorate, The Role of Empathy Through Storytelling in Young Driver Road Safety Education, Dr. Jamie Blight says that storytelling can be used to have people empathetically connect to the messages of road safety adverts. By using real stories from real survivors of car accidents, we can access emotions other than fear. One of those emotions we're able to use empathy to access is sadness. When you make somebody sad with one of these road safety ads instead of afraid, their brain will automatically begin analyzing the situation to try and find some meaningfulness in their sadness. The use of empathy as a basis for these as well instead of fear directly challenges the mentality of it won't happen to me. By connecting with the subject of this film through empathy, it kind of has already happened to you emotionally. You are made to feel other people's very real pain and loss and those feelings can very easily be transferred and relayed to your own life. 
Okay, so having talked about all of that for ages, where does that leave us with the modern road safety ads? So the RSA still produces loads of road safety campaigns, but now they have very much shift gears away from fear and shame to a more productive approach of actually trying to provide people useful information about how to stay safe on the road. They provide lots of campaigns about being aware of cyclists and motorcyclists and how to overtake on motorways. They provide lots of information for kids about how to cross the street safely. I think maybe the biggest example of this pivot that they have done is their Crash Lives campaign. The Crash Lives campaign has been going on for a very long time, but it is usually just someone's first-hand account of a car accident, whether it is an injury they received, or a loved one they've lost, or a doctor who had to inform somebody that their child had died. They're not flashy, they're not gory, they don't revel in people's suffering. There's no impact shots, there's no breaking glass, there's no neck snapping. It's just someone sitting down, looking at you, saying, this is what happens when you drive recklessly. Please drive safe. And as well, in recent years, they have launched campaigns that aim to use the medium of TV to full effect and access different emotions. One I think is particularly good is an anti-texting and driving campaign they did a few years ago. So it's first person, and it's just somebody's looking at a phone, and then they don't realize that they're holding up the queue at the coffee place, or they almost walk into somebody, and then they put it away right as they get into the car. And it's great, because it uses visuals to try and relay something to you, and you can think of all of those times where you've held up a cue or bumped into something because you were looking at your phone. I think that's a great campaign. Also, check out this use of a jump scare. They also recently launched a campaign, which is what do you think would happen? It, it tries to use comedy to say, what if you just made sure everyone in the car was safe? Comedy, fun visual effects, I love it. Overall, I think the RSA have adapted very well to this new style of road safety campaigns over the years. They have adapted to smaller budgets and different emotions and have found ways to use what resources they have to really try and make Irish roads safer. I think it's easy to look back and say that maybe they were more memorable when they were horrific but maybe they weren't memorable for the right reasons. The fact that I know how to overtake people on a motorway with like pinpoint accuracy, I think that is probably more effective than understanding what it would look like if my head uh, smashed so hard into my girlfriend's that I gave her permanent brain damage. So that's what happened to road safety videos. Um, budgets got smaller and research was done and it turns out the best way to prevent people dying on the roads is give people penalty points and suspend licenses if they repeatedly drive poorly and um, don't traumatize children. Thanks to politicians like Jackie Healy Ray and Michael Healy Ray, Ireland right now is the only country in the world that's actively working to try and reintroduce drink driving. This is... <laughs> The Mexicans wouldn't even have the balls for that like this is. We're trying to reintroduce drink driving, but here's the twist, it's just for country people. That's the... Because country people live further away from the Pope, down crooked, unlit mountain roads, and should be allowed to drive them roads drunk. That's the kind of shit that keeps the community together. Now, a pragmatic city politician might say, well, what if he hits a pedestrian? And the answer to that is, and if a man is walking the roads at four o'clock in the morning, he's probably drunk too. And so, when a drunk driver hits a drunk pedestrian, sure, whose fault is that? 